Now in the Open Mind in the first of five programmes, John Quinn draws through a personal archive to highlight developments in Irish life and society in the 20th century, in a century of voices. A century of voices? What does it mean? A hundred voices? Well, it may come to that, but no. Or a century in voice, perhaps. For the last five Open Mind programmes of this year, of this century, come with me on a voyage. A voyage through the 20th century. A voyage recalling not epic events, but moments, both serious and trivial. Moments, circumstances, memories, which will reflect everyday life in the 20th century. The life of some well-known people, the life of little-known people. Life lived through a century of amazing change. Voyage through the 20th century, a century of voices. We begin with the writer Father O'Donnell, who at the turn of the century was seven years old. There were no clocks. In fact, clocks didn't come into to, um, the, my area until they make the building of the railway. I couldn't tell you what I was machine very early. But I, I, the alarm clocks came in then because men had to get up on time to go to the rail, go to the to walk on the railway. But previous to that, they went by the stars. I distinctly remember my mother and women next door uh, in the very early morning, uh, judging by the stars uh, what time they should set off to walk six miles to a mission to open the, to the to a mission that was being held in the area. And they used to go each morning, and they went entirely by the stars. There weren't, there weren't any clocks. Emigration was a recurring feature of life in Donegal at the turn of the century. The farewell party for the emigrants was known as the American Wake. And it always ended up, the last song was, Lads and lasses, as you're passing, he that hear these words I'm going to say, how the people from old Ireland are are moving are moving off to America. Oh yes, they're bound for a foreign nation, for on their own home they can stand. And as they put their foot on board, they say they're bound for the Yankee land. And hurrah for the darling sons of Ireland, our fair da- daughter, or our fair son, as the case might be, is going away. And every day they're emigrating and thousands off to America. And after the American wake, there was the convoy. Well, the convoy was um, the town land would accompany the person or the, or the, the few that were emigrating. Um, the whole town land would go to the station and see them off. And they were very affecting and very, very, uh, very emotional scenes. Because in those days, of course, going to America was really passing away forever from the family, from the family connection. There was no such thing as an over and back to the things there is today. Father O'Donnell. Another writer, Sean O'Foylan, was born at the turn of the century, in 1900, in the city of Cork, and in extreme poverty. But poverty never stifled the young O'Foylan's imagination. Witness the delight when Sean and his two brothers got a whole bright shilling for Christmas. Twelve whole pennies, twenty-four pennies, to be spent between the three of us, on anything on earth that our hearts desired. On that December, for weeks on end, Wellington Road and St. Luke's, which was our daily walk, were forgotten. We pressed our noses to every shop window in the city, big windows and little windows, in big streets and back streets, until the end. We settled for a clockwork train made up of a green and black engine about the size of a mouse, two carriages, and a circular rail about 12 inches in diameter. We were poor, we were poverty itself, but our poverty watched that little mouse engine run around its single circle on one winding five and a half times non-stop, drawing after it all of its two carriages and running its circle several times more, although dangerously fast, without any carriages at all. I can still smell that engine. I can taste its enamel. We took turns at winding it, warning one another to go slowly, be gentle. This was very delicate mechanism. When we found that the black tin roofs of the two carriages could slide off, we put corks inside them for passengers. We put cotton wool in the funnel of the little engine for steam. We made cardboard stations named after real stations. 
We made stations, marked Birmingham, Chester. We went to Rome. We went beyond it on the Orient Express to Constantinople in our little shilling train. Sean of Whelan. A third writer, Dennis Johnston, grew up in Dublin, an only child. Here he recalls the wonder of the Great Exhibition in Dublin when he was six years old. It uh, happened in, in uh, 1907, and it took place, of course, in that place which is now Herbert Park. And a lot of the relics of the exhibition, geographically speaking, are still there, including the, the, the long pond, which was the pond intended for the, the water chute. In the middle of the place, there was a great central hall with four wings sticking out from each side, and it had got... And there was a, a there was a another section. There was a section for mechanical devices, which you could have a mar marvelous time if you were a child. On there was a, an actual railway engine in it, which you could get up and look at the place where the driver and the con and the stoker worked. There was a, a tram, a lovely one of the early double decker trams with eight bogey wheels, you know, which subsequently worked on the Dorky line. I think it was called 324. It was a tram which we looked at with awe. There was every conceivable kind of other industrial and artistic palace. There were some very, very good pictures there, which I didn't appreciate much at the time. But there was also a movie house. The first movie I ever saw was in this exhibition. It, it, there had been some moving pictures shown, I think, down in the rotunda before this, but I never saw them until I saw this thing. There, was, there were very short films, lasting, I suppose, about five minutes. The one that I remember most clearly was called Curing the Blind, and it showed you on this rather flickering screen a blind man holding out a mug, and people passed him and put money in the mug, and he put it in his pocket. And then finally, a, a rather sceptical girl came along, and she looked at him for some time, and then she went away and came back with a bucket of water, which she threw over him. And he sat up immediately and opened his eyes. It was called Curing the Blind. That's the whole picture. There was nothing more to it than that. But it was the first movies that a great many of us ever saw, and, uh, of course, before long, there was proper movie houses in Dublin, beginning, of course, down in the rotunda itself. And subsequently, there was one that Joyce made, which everybody reads about nowadays, called the Volta. Mm -hmm. All these things, well, the associates have their origin somehow or other in that exhibition, to which, I may say, the King of England came, old Edward VII came to, the, to see the exhibition, or whether he came for some other purpose, I don't know, but certainly he, he, he came and landed at what was then called Kingston, and then drove up in, in, uh, with a cavalry escort, which we all saw when he came up through Ball's Bridge, and um, went to the exhibition and then sailed off again after he'd seen it. I remember we could see the fairy lights from the back of our house. And one night when my parents were out, I don't know, they were out at some function or other, and, and I got up and dressed myself and stole off. I had a season ticket which got me in. And I was subsequently captured by my parents who came back and found me gone and started off in a great state of excitement and knew what I would be up to. And found me, of course, brooding over an extraordinary model of the Battle of Waterloo, which is at the bottom of one of the great flights of stairs in the middle of it, escorted me home. I think they were so pleased to find me okay that they rather forgave me for having done that. Dennis Johnston on the pleasures of a Dublin childhood. If you lived in Kerry, however, and you wished to savour the pleasure of an All-Ireland football final in Dublin in the early part of this century, a whole adventure lay before you. Hugh O'Connell from Scarthed Lynn in County Kerry remembers the 1913 All-Ireland football final. I walked it. What time of the morning did you get up for the match? I got up around half past four. Oh, imagine that. Made my tea and had my breakfast, bread, butter and tea and couple of cuts into my pocket for the <laughs> for my dinner. I got this, sir. We went down up. I met my two friends down at the road and we crossed the river flesh up to Scotty Glen and on down the road walking and that just is walking we were. The road was crowded with every man that was worth calling himself a man went to see Kerry playing then. And you were down to Castle Island? We went to Castle Island and into the train. Six bob to carry us to Dublin. Six bob returned? Six, yeah, that's right. Six oh, bob. Six bob to go up and come down. Yeah. Well, what time did you get up then? 
I don't know if I can for some we landed in Dublin. It was after 12 o'clock and you were 1 o'clock, I suppose, maybe. Did you take any nourishment before the game? We did because we were traveling along this the flags in this street. Yes. I think they're yeah, called they it Marlborough Street. Marlborough, yeah. This non open here. Just, would we like it in? So of course we would. We went in. We had three pints of stout, eight of us, the three of us. Very good. So we were very well fitted. Yeah, we're not sure if we come out. Don't blame you. That's so right. we went on to the field and the shilling to go in. That was all right too. It was very... Reasonable, fine. Very reasonable, of course, but uh, shillings were milling scarce then. Yes, they were reasonable. They were very scarce. We went in and everyone should the carry me in. Well, a way too good from at the bar. That's right. And they won. Yeah, they won the All Ireland that day. Oh, though. they won. And that was what year was that, you say? That was 1913. 13, that's right. Best I can remember. Just before the Great War, I suppose. Yes, that's, that's right. right. It was yeah. before the Great, the Great War. War. That's right. Well, so all right. We've come home. Did you have a lunch that you had in the pocket? You remember we said since morning? I didn't think any more of that lunch <laughs> because <laughs> for months we had the porter drink. We didn't think any more about lunches or anything else. But we come home playing anywhere we were delighted with ourselves. Very good. And we landed at seven four. Some one or two o'clock or whatever ten it was, I don't know. Yeah. But we come out and we all headed for Scott. For Scott Lane. Well it was, it was a certainly a great adventure, wasn't it? Yeah, it was all right. Yeah. And uh, you were happy, men, there's no doubt about it. Half four in the morning, I suppose nearly half four the next morning before you got home. But just dining day. Well, look with that. Oh, and walked a lot of the ways and stood all day inside, I suppose. You wouldn't know a soft seat doing the match, would you? No, there was no seat there at that day. Oh, imagine that. Hugh O'Connell's Memories of 1913. Margaret Deary was a student in University College Dublin in 1916. Here she recalls one of her English lecturers, Thomas McDonough. The first, uh, the first year I was in college, I went in Septem September or October. And the following Easter holidays, before we broke up, we had as a lecturer in Irish poetry, Thomas McDonough, if you ever heard of him. And uh, in those days, it was at the back of this place, it wasn't done up like this, there was a lecture room, and you went downstairs to, down steps to, it was underground, and it was commonly called hell, not on account of the lectures, but because you went downstairs. And the, the last day of that, the Easter term, for some reason or another, boys had lit sea candles on the lectern. And Thomas McDonough, who lectured in Irish poetry, he came down and he stood and he looked and he said, three candles, not lucky. And that was the last time we ever saw him. Morning, morning! Standing! Look! And on May 3rd, 1916, the leaders of the rebellion were executed. Among them, Thomas MacDonough. Eight. You shall not hear the bittern cry in the wild sky where he is lain, nor voices of the sweeter birds above the wailing of the rain, nor shall he know when loud march blows through slanting snows her fanfare shrill blowing to flame the golden cup of many an upset daffodil. And when the dark cow leaves the moor, and pastures poor with greedy weeds, perhaps he'll hear her low at morn, lifting her horn in pleasant meads. Lines written by the young Meath poet Francis Ledwidge, in memory of Thomas MacDonagh. A year later, Ledwidge would die on the battlefield of Ypres. You ask me what I am doing. I am a unit in the great war, doing and suffering, admiring great endeavor and condemning great dishonor. I may be dead before this reaches you, but I will have done my part. Death is as interesting to me as life. I have seen so much of it from Suvla to Serbia and now in France. I am always homesick. I hear the roads calling and the hills and the rivers wondering where I am. It is terrible to be always homesick.
July 31st, Ledwich and his comrades worked through a violent storm, laying a road through the sodden terrain. A road which would bring supplies to the front. Backbreaking work. A moment's pause to swallow a mug of tea. Dear Mrs. Ledwidge, I do not know how to write to you about the death of your dear son, Francis. Quite apart from his wonderful gifts, he was such a lovable boy, and I was so fond of him. We had many talks together, and he used to read me his poems. He died on the feast of St. Ignatius Loyola. The evening before he died, he had been to confession. On the morning of the 31st, he was present at Mass and received Holy Communion. May God comfort you and may his holy mother pray for you. I shall say a mass for Francis as soon as I can. Charles Henry de Vass, S.J. The poet's brother, Joe Ledwidge, recalls hearing the news of his brother's death. I was at home at the time, and uh, I was passing through the village, and I noticed a little group of people around the post office. I didn't approach them because I was... I was really apprehensive that something was wrong because they all looked in my direction. So I had to come home on my way, but I knew Frank was gone. And uh, unfortunately, it was I that had to break the news to my mother. And uh, it's something indeed I don't like to recall. It's just too deep for us. As ever is the case, in spite of wars and revolutions, ordinary life went on. In May 1916, a young Dublin accountant, Eugene Leonard Clark, travelled to West Cork to spend an Easter holiday with his girlfriend. When he tried to catch the return train from Cork, he was told the trains weren't running. There was some bit of bother in the capital city. And through that twist of fate, Eugene Leonard Clark found work in Cork. He became the second employee in a new venture that was starting up by the Lee, Henry Ford and Son. But there were soon were numbers three and four and five and so on, so that in a matter of days, we had about 300 men on the payroll. That was part of my job, to make up the payrolls, draw the cash through walking up town from up the, from uh, the Victoria Quay up to the bank in South Malcock, draw the money, pay the men, that was that. And that went on for uh, some years. We put up the initial buildings, all designed by this good man who came from Detroit, Raymond Brown. He was a construction engineer, and uh, he was my boss. And I was his sector, and I did all their accountancy work. I had uh, meetings very interesting meetings with Mr. Henry Ford, the senior, the father of the lot, himself, and also of his son, Edson, who died rather a short time after. And I also met then as a schoolboy, the present Henry Ford, who is uh, well known in most countries at present. I had visits to Mr. Ford's office, no very long engagements because he was a really busy man and he came to his office and factory every day and if he went out for a ride on Sunday he very often just drove through the factory. It was huge of course, running into many acres, probably hundreds of acres. He had a lovely home which he called Fair Lane. He called his home Fair Lane. It's not generally known that that had any connection with Ireland, but it has, because I got that from himself. Fair Lane used to be a very important street in the city of Cork. I don't think it's any longer there. They've ch joined it up, integrated with another street or something like that, I think, because I did make an effort to try and get the signboard Fair Lane, and I failed. Somebody must have pulled it down and lost it because I, I was anxious to get it. Fair Lane. 
and the fair lane came from the name of one Irish lady who was connected with the family and had taken a very important part in the raising of his family when in his young days and she came from Fair Lane Cork. He had that fund for Ireland, you see. It was very difficult to get it out because the man being so busy, naturally. You couldn't imagine being able to give very much time to any subject, really, but he did have that always in his mind, Fair Lane, so much so that he had a private train, which he used traveling all over America whenever he wanted to, by himself and his staff, and that train was the Fair Lane. And he also gave the same name to one of the best cars he ever built in Detroit, Fair Lane, a rather biggish car. He was a very kind, nice man to handle and deal with, very simple in his ways, very simple in his ways, and devoted to his work. And, um, I mean, when designs were changed and everything like that, he fully went into them, and he had a, a sort of inborn uh, knowledge of mecha everything mechanically how it works and how it fails and everything like that. He, he was a wonderful man on design. He just seemed to be able to work a picture in his mind of the most complicated things and solve them. Eugene Leonard Clark's memories of Henry Ford. And Eugene ultimately became the first native managing director of Henry Ford and Son in Cork. The coming of the motor car would revolutionize transport, would revolutionize daily life, in the early decades of the century. Sean McBride, son of Major John McBride and Maud Gunn, learned how to drive a car at a very young age. I was driving in cars very young at the time, but I had a car, I left a style of motorbike in that car, and I was driving Madame Markovich. And um, a French journalist had been over here, uh, and we were arrested, and uh, Madame Markovich, I think, taken to jail then, I think, and I was there, we were taken to the wild world, and the French journalist who was also involved in the French diplomatic service was locked up in the wild world, and he was furious, absolutely, and uh, raised around the whole night long, demanding to see his counsel, and he finally let out the next day, but then I ended up in Montjoy, and I spent a couple of months in Montjoy then. Fourteen was very young to be in jail. It was also very young to be to be driving a car. You, you were uh, well. Well, I, I looked a good deal older than I was. I could pass off easily at seventeen or eighteen. And a, a car to be driving a car, of course, in those days would, would have been uh, something special. Yes, and it was, this was this was a car and a half. It was a huge second-hand XRMI car, a standard car. It was about God knows about twenty-five feet long, colossal thing like battleship. Sean McBride had quite an extraordinary childhood. Much of it was spent in France, where he flew kites on the Normandy beach with W.B. Yeats, and was taken for treats in Paris with his idol, the writer James Stevens. My childhood idol was, was James Stevens. James Stevens, I was, I was going on very well with him, I just adore him absolutely. He was marvellous with children and he was marvellous with telling stories. And I remember one, one story in particular, his very there was a, a Fenian called James Stevens, and uh, James Stevens, the poet, the writer, was a small man, a little bit hunchbacked, you know? And he used to say, well, James Stevens, James Stevens, he wasn't like me at all, he was a big, burly man, a courageous man. And um, he, they tried to arrest him one day in College Green at a meeting, and he lifted four policemen up in the air and escaped. Oh, he had full, full of stories of that kind, you know, yeah. that naturally appealed to me as a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he also helped you in your, in your, your passion of the time and in, in stamp collecting. That's right. He used to come and take me out uh, from school and in Paris and he used to bring me uh, to a stamp dealer to buy stamps. I had a passion stamp collector at the time. And uh, it was a great occasion. He used to bring me to this uh, stamp dealers, you know. And I was, he told me he'd give me the maximum price I could spend. Mm. And he would go and sit on my, in a chair in the corner and re reading a book. And I maybe spent, maybe spent an hour shooting stamps. That was kids, they knew I'd say, 
careful about the scan stones I wanted, you know, not to exceed my limit. Mm. And then after that, we used to go to a very good ice cream and cake shop called Rampelmeyer's. I still remember, it doesn't exist anymore now. It's been with three volumes of ice cream and cake and plenty of stories from James Stevens. Mm. Now at this stage, we might uh, take a break here and listen to the voice of James Stevens reading one of his own poems. Little things that run and quail and die in silence and despair. Little things that fight and fail and fall on sea and earth and air. All trapped and frightened little things. The mouse, the pony, hear our prayer as we forgive those done to us, the lamb, the linnet, and the hare, forgive us all our trespasses, little creatures everywhere. The voices of James Stevens and earlier Sean McBride. So despite war abroad and revolution at home, in rural Ireland in the early decades of this century, Life moved at a slow and measured pace. We end this programme with Sean O'Fueloin's marvellous evocation of summer holidays on his Auntie Nan's farm in Rathkeel, County Limerick. Holidays when he did an absolutely glorious nothing. I did nothing. I sat by a well and saw a spider race with delicate legs across the cold water from out of his cold cavern. I did the rounds of a pattern, that is to say, a place dedicated to a patron saint at the holy well of Nantanon, near Ballantran. I did it with scores of old women coming from long distances in their pink carts to pray as they circled, and when they finished, to hang a medal or a bit of cloth on a sacred thorn tree by the well until it looked as ragged as a servant's head in curling papers in the morning. I saw a line of cows pass along a road, their otters dripping into the dust. I went with my Uncle Tom, each of us seated on the shaft of, a, of the donkey cart, out to his bits of fields in the commons near Loch Du Hail. We took with us for the day a bottle of cold tea and great slices of wheel cake cooked in a bastable and plastered with country butter and cheap jam. All day he went slowly up and down the ridges on one knee thinning his turnips and I wandered. What did I see? I, I saw a row of poplars, twenty poplars whispering to the wind. I picked and I chewed the seeds of the pink mallow. I saw how the branch of a thorn tree in the armpit of an alder had worn itself and its lover smooth from squeakingly rubbing against it this last, oh, this last forty or fifty years. I saw an old ruined castle and a big house with the iron gates hanging from its curved pillars crookedly. And all the time, away across the saucer of the lake, there was the distant church spire of Rathkeel, like a finger of silence rising from an absolutely heavenly level horizon. You see what I mean when I say nothing? A fairy tale, a child's memory, a cradle song, crumbs in the pocket, dust, a seed. I lay on my back among lone fields and wondered whether the cloudy sky was moving or was it stopped. Not the childhood boy, but nostalgia, tears. Things no traveller would notice or want to notice, but things from which a boy of this region would never get free. Things wrapping cataracts of love about his eyes, knotting tendrils of love about his heart. That programme was presented and produced by John Quinn. Now, in the open mind, in the second of five programmes, John Quinn trawls through a personal archive to highlight developments in Irish life and society in the 20th century. A century of voices. Anne and Catherine Gregory had an extraordinary childhood. They are the granddaughters of Lady Augusta Gregory, and they spent most of their childhood in Cool Park in County Galway, where Lady Gregory played hostess to the cream of the artistic world in the early decades of this century.
Sean O'Casey, W.B. Yates, Augustus John, George Bernard Shaw, Jack Yates. Of all of them, Anne and Catherine Gregory had no doubt as to who was their favourite. Oh, GBS. Yes, Bernard Shaw, every time. He mm. was wonderful. He obviously liked children, I think, because he was a natural, wasn't he? Yep. He really was. But uh, one visit, which was during the First War, uh, <laughs> we weren't allowed bread with jam and butter on it. You could have jam or butter, wartime. Uh, GBS asked for jam, and Grandma looked at him and said, but you've got butter on your bread, you don't have both. Oh. So the next thing we spotted was, he sort of held up his plate to Grandma and said, look, that's only a slice of dry bread. Now can I have jam, please? And she said, yes, of course. But we'd seen him turn the slice of bread over, and the butter was on the underside. We were horrified. We were horrified. Oh, I think, mind you, we <laughs> probably thinking why well, else we think of it. It is, that. absolutely. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and, this. and horror of horrors, the children discovered that George Bernard Shaw cheated, actually cheated, at Hunt the Thimble. Wherever we hid it, he was able to find it almost at once. Well, yeah. uh, we yeah. were hiding it. He had his hands up. We were horrified. We were very distressed. distressed. And we went to Grandma and um, he said, he cheated. Yeah. Would you believe it? GBS cheated. <laughs> so in the end, I think, uh, I had to sort of say, well, it was all a joke, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, we were all upset about this, and, and also he was ill, I think, afterwards, but anyhow, we were upset about it, and Grandma said, well, you know, he, must, he was very hurt that you thought he was cheating, so we'll, you must send him some apples, some of his special apples, Crofton's. So we sent him off some apples, and we had a most marvellous poem, which he sent as thank you, and uh, it was written in his own handwriting on, post, on the back of pe postcards, which had pictures on one side, and it, um, it started two ladies of Galway called Catherine and Anna, whom some call a Kushla and some call a Lana, on finding the gate of the fruit garden undone, stole Grandma's apples and sent them to London. And Grandma said the poor village school children were better behaved than the well brought up cool children and threatened them with the most merciless whippings if ever again they laid hand on her pippins. In vain they explained that the man who was battening on Grandma's apples would die without fattening. She seized the piano and threw it at Anna then shrieking at Catherine, just let me catch you, she walloped her hard with the drawing room statue. God save us, herself has gone crazy, cried Mary, and is that how a lady of title should carry on? If you dare to address me like that, shouted Granny, goodbye to your wages, you shan't have a penny. Go back to your pots and your pans and your canisters. With that, she threw Marion over the banisters. And now, declared Granny, I feel so much better that I'll write Mr. Shaw a most beautiful letter and tell him how happy our lives are at cool under Grandmama, darling, the Nevelson Rule. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful getting that absolute Boston Boston. Boston. It's absolutely terrific. Anne and Catherine Gregory remembering George Bernard Shaw as they walk through Cool Park in the rain. Now meet a man who's as old as the century, Horig McGrainer, born on the 6th of June, 1900. As a young primary teacher in the early 1920s, Horig had one problem. He knew no Irish. On the advice of one John Collins, brother of Michael Collins, Horig took himself from the Midlands down to Ballingiri in West Cork to learn Irish while working on a farm. That was a new world. It was my first time. I didn't know what mountains were. I didn't know what mountainy land was. I didn't know the weather worked on mountainy land. I didn't know that the shower or rain didn't put them under for shelter the way we did. They stayed out of it. They didn't mind if they got wet, and uh, they, were grand, they were grand people. But that was my first, I didn't know a word of Irish when I went there, not one word. I remember Ty Tony, God rest him, saying to me, when I went into his shop, he had the shop, he didn't live on the farm, he said, he says, well, Queen Gwelling, you go, I didn't know what he was saying. One day I was out, there was a, a, a hired man in the house, Jack Doherty, Jack had powerful Irish. And we were out cutting a load of feed for the cows, uh, a couple of creelfuls. And Jack sat down to fill his pipe. Uh, it'll be about my first week there, you see. And he pointed to the winkers on the horse. 
And he said, the father, he said, Shin Shriyan. And I said, Shriyan. Shriyan on Kapil, he says. Shin Kapil, Shriyan on Kapil. Ta differiak down. But ta say, Shin Yon wrote the Dutch, and then later on to Shin Yon. Well, years afterwards, I told this long after Padre. Well, I thought he was laughing to say, no, Doctor, didn't know what the Tishel Yenuna was. <laughs> he heard some chat going on in the kitchen, you see, some night with people who were learning and heard this thing, you see. And the Tishel Yenuna was mentioned. Mm. But overall, it was an amazing experience. It was an extraordinary experience. As an, an extraordinary time, you see, for a uh, penniless fellow to go down there and work, if you like. Uh, I had no, I didn't mind working at that time. People that didn't know me, know anything about me. Uh, you, you can never forget it to them. They were wonderful people. Uh, I, I must have been the last of the poor scholars. And what a scholar he proved to be. Later, Pori Magrena collected folklore. About the best trade, best one ever I got was from an old man, 95 years of age, Grey Pat Yill. He lived down near Balnamuk. An eyewitness account of the Battle of Balnamuk. His uncles were there. His mother was there that morning. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a long tale, but it was a very clear description of what happened. The, the, the women went there, he said, and that creels on their back, and that bonnocks of bread in it for the starving Frenchmen. And the Frenchmen were, they were pulling up the rushes and chewing the white roots at them, he said. They were that so, was, yeah, that's what, 1798? 1798. Yes. Yes. 1798. And then they were, if you think of the journey they were after making from the west of Ireland, across desolate country, no roads, bridges, nothing. And I, I suppose a hungry horde following them the whole way. Amazing. In two leaps of memory, we're transported back 200 years. In the 1920s and 30s, public health was a major concern in Ireland. Poor living conditions were a breeding ground for a variety of ravaging diseases. As a young GP working in Lorgan, County Armagh, Jim Deeney had first-hand experience of those diseases especially the dreaded tuberculosis. We were picking a, a kid of about 16. And she said, Maggie hasn't been so well lately. And I had a clown and you'd, as I say, you'd notice there's just a faint wee bluish sand oozed on her cheeks and her eyes shining and take a shit of temperature. And uh, you wouldn't think there's anything wrong with her. And the story thing was all oh, these kids have suddenly become very beautiful. Mm. And you listen to her long, you'd hear the wee whisper in Ralph's all through her lungs. Six weeks she'd be dead. Galloping TB, millinery TB. The thing would get into the bloodstream and go all through the body. Mm. Now, that was an extreme case. And then you find ex servicemen from the war. And they wouldn't be able to work this of chronic TB and they sit around and <laughs> they wouldn't be out working and they'd. They'd mind kids. Next thing, the kids would get meningitis, dosed by your men. Now, I tried to find out, to get a kind of stand back and take a good look at it, get a pattern of things. So what I did was, I dug out from the records every death from tuberculosis over 25 years. And I marked down the houses where they lived and the time they died. And, in fact, I can show you a map I made, it's up in the attic still, a map I made of the town. And you can see where there's a black spot for three deaths in the one house, a red one for two deaths in one house, and a, a green one or something for the, with one death. And you can see how they're all little clusters, and how they all happened within a few years. In other words, there's a little epidemic of TB, and then it would burn itself out, and you could see where two chaps who were mates, you know, and go to football match together and play football together and all this sort of thing. Both one of the 20 and the other's 21 sort of thing. Die within a year of one another. In this way, I mapped out. Now, the thing is, I realised this was a long drawn out epidemic. In fact, it was an epidemic which lasted well over 100 years, about 150 years. It started before the famine and it ended in about 1967. Now, three quarters of a million Irish people died that epidemic. And the trouble of the thing was, is when you found a case, they were all ready too far gone to cure. You see, and this is one of the problems. Therefore, 
the whole strategy that came out of the TB survey afterwards, and out of that then we evolved a strategy which enabled us to wipe the thing out finally. Jim Deeney. The threat of tuberculosis was even greater in the crowded cities. The writer, Jim Plunkett, grew up in Sandymount in Dublin. It was a wonderful place to grow up in, but there was one building that Jim Plunkett avoided. Between uh, the Coast Guards uh, station and the Pigeon House Fort itself, there was a sanatorium there for uh, TB patients, that's consumption, and we were very much frightened of it because it was known at the time, once a person went in there, they stayed in there, they died in there, because consumption, of course, was a killing uh, disease at that time, and it killed an enormous amount of people. Uh, in fact, death was very much, uh, very prominent, very much to the fore in those days. I, I've, uh, I remember school pals and playmates dropping off, just disappearing off the streets, and then you'd hear they were dead. I remember two young boys in particular, I suppose they were five, six years of age, they always wore, wore white gamsies or jerseys. And uh, there might have been about a difference of a year or two years in their ages, but they looked very much alike and were dressed very much alike. And they were my companions, shall we say, for the whole of the summer. And then one day they disappeared, and then they didn't come out again, and then we heard they were dead. So this was TV, it ravaged whole families. Life had much to offer in the then much smaller city of Dublin. The seaside was Jim Plunkett's playground, and what is now suburbia was open countryside to be explored. And then there was a the life for the streets, I mean, the, the vendors coming round. Uh, the man with his barrow, the rag and bone man, we called him, and he'd, uh, I can't forget his call now, he'd call out anyway, something like any rags or any bottles, any bottles or any jam jars and so on. And you'd move around the house and bring out old rags and bottles and things, and you'd get a balloon or something like that in return. And then there were the co men selling coal. You'd, uh, I remember... Often enough, on a maybe a November evening, sitting in a room, and down below, or out in the street, in the mist, in the fog, you'd hear the, the coal man's bell. It's a very distinctive, rather lonely little sound. And then he'd be shouting, coal blocks, coal blocks. And in fact, if we happened to be on the street, when a man, when the coal man, or the bell man, as we call them, were passing, you see, uh, he'd say, coal blocks, coal blocks, and then we'd wait... Uh, uh, for the interval, and we say, what do you feed your mother on? And of course he'd say, cold blocks, cold blocks. And there was the attraction of a new and fast-growing medium, the cinema. And there was only two of to get in on, on uh, Saturday, Saturday matinee. And if we hadn't got the two of or if we'd only eat part of the two we used to scour the back lanes looking for a baby power bottle. Because the publican would never hesitate to give you a halfpenny for a baby power bottle. And uh, if you search diligently, we usually manage to find one here or there. You scour the neighbourhood for them. And that's how we used to get to the pictures. And uh, then we'd, later on the strand of that, we'd reenact all the charges and the shooting and the whatever mm -hmm. had gone on. Jim Plunkett. Popular entertainment came in many forms. Here's Tommy O'Brien recalling the coming of the circus to his native town of Clonmel. Not just the circus, but the grand parade. And this was billed as by Duffy's a mile of glittering splendor. Now it wasn't exactly a mile, but by golly it wasn't very far off of it. The circus used to come in, and of course we knew when to be coming in of a Monday morning, oh about eleven o'clock in the day. And one end of the town, right down through the town, the profession, wagons, camels, elephants, cages and lions. Uh, acrobats performing, you know, on the streets as they went along, cowboys on horses, any amount of them, God knows how many horses, and they do stunts on the street, lassos and all things, like that, all for free, just as good as nearly as the circus. Then the circus itself. Tommy O'Brien went on to become a popular entertainer as a record enthusiast. Here he recalls his own first experience of recorded music. There was a man lived at the top of my own street, Wolfton Street it was. Frank Budden was his name, a bearded postman, who incidentally was a great swimmer, a very nice man. And I was in, I would say about four or five at the time, and I know I was wearing a pinafore, and he called me one day and I was on the street, I have something for you, Tom, Tommy said he, something to hear. So I went up and he took me by the hand and brought me into the little house, which is still there, incidentally. 
and there he produced what I thought was an extraordinary looking yoke. Uh, I found out afterwards, of course, what it was. It wasn't a gramophone. It was the predecessor of the gramophone, a phonograph. Uh, the difference between a phonograph and a gramophone being the gramophone plays flat records. The phonograph played cylinders. And you shoved the cylinder in at the side of the machine and the needle went on and the cylinder went round and round and round that way, but not on the flat. Mm. And uh, I was watching him doing this. I didn't know what he was going to do or what the result would be, but this or something like it was the result. <laughs> Is on my travels wide, but my heart is tender new on Bonnie Kate McBride. Although I am no a fella that will throw a word away, I'm surprised sometimes myself at all I've got to say. Roman and the gloaming on the Bonnie Banks of Clyde. The great Harry Lauder, remembered by Tommy O'Brien. The writer Molly Keane grew up in a very privileged environment, but in many ways it was also a very lonely childhood. We, we lived, in, I suppose, in a sort of very isolated country way. One made one's own amusements, one had one's pony, one's donkey, the hayloft to play in. And all the people on the place that we simply loved, they were really our companions. Not their children, but the people themselves. These would be the, the staff? Yeah. Mm. And you, particularly, of course, you were in the care of governesses for most of the day. Well, yes, from the time I was about six, I suppose. Well, they were, we weren't in that care. They, we were absolutely free. They paid after the lesson times. We hardly saw them, except at meal time. But in theory, they were in, in charge of your education. More or less, yes, they were. Such as it was, and God knows I'm the worst educated woman in the world. You didn't learn very much from them? Nothing. We had Mrs. Markham's History of England, and we had Gill's Geography, and some terrible French grammar that I can't remember the name of, and books of little little rhymes and poems. Some French, some English that we were supposed to learn by heart, I can imagine. I was. You were very fond of your mother as a child. Yes, I was. I really was. Though I didn't see a terrible lot of her, you know. I mean, when we were very young, it was very much, she didn't come into the nursery much, hardly. And we used to go down after tea, dressed up in blue velvet and lace frill, and she would read aloud to us, and then back up to bed by half past six or seven. Another feature of a young lady's education was the dancing class. Well, it used to happen in County when I was, must have been about seven. Kind of killed there because Wexford was really much more savage than something like a dancing club. And it was held in a big house in Kind of killed there every Wednesday. And the children used to go there, I suppose, about 25 of us. There might have been quite a few children around that I didn't, only knew quite a few of. And there's a gentleman called Mr. Leggett Byrne who used to come down from Dublin and take the classes. And I remember he had kid gloves and he used to slap you with them. And if he wasn't slapping, he used to slap himself in time to the music with them. And I never learned anything there, nothing at all. I'd know we have the music, so no wonder. In those days, I must have had some sense of rhythm because I got on all right with the dancing later. But then, really, it was all sort of mm. gothic to me. Molly Keane. It was a very different lifestyle for Patrick Nolan, a young farmer trying to eke out a living in the Stony Burn in County Clare in the early 1930s. But one summer evening, Patrick had his moment of glory. It was a day in the, it was in the month of May, I think. I went up to, up to Craig there to look at some calves or something. And I, I crossed over this patch of rock. And I had gone over it several times before, later, earlier. And I didn't see what I saw. When I came down over the rock, there was a small little, a small little ribbon like that now, sticking out. And I said, what is this foreign body? What put it there? You know, my exact word, my exact thought. 
and uh, I stooped down. As a matter of fact, I walked three or four further on in my journey. And my came back again. What is it? I picked out a few little bits of stone that was around her. And I got this well with my two fingers and I levered it out. And there was my colour of gold doubled over. Understand now? Mm. Lapped over. Yes. Because it wouldn't fit into the crevice. Fully. You see? Whoever put it there had to fold it over and then it fitted in by pushing it. Except that little bit. And that little bit that I saw and I caught my eye and I said, what the hell is that? foreign body down there in that right. crevice. What Patrick Nolan found turned out to be a priceless national treasure, the Leninchian gold collar, some 3,000 years old. Around the same time in the early 1930s, a young Dungarvan-born scientist made an amazing breakthrough in the world of nuclear physics when he and a colleague managed to split the atom. His name was Ernest Walton. Well, I, I was working on, on this for uh, a period of n nearly five years before we got any, any definite results. We, we tried va various sorts of things which didn't work and then we had to modify things and so on. And uh, for most of those five years you had very little to show for your work. The time taken uh, can vary enormously in, in research. Um, sometimes you get quick results, other times you'll have to work for years before you get anything very interesting or important. And in physics, the s sort of failure you may have is that you build a bit of apparatus which uh, isn't, turns out not to be suitable for getting the results that you're hoping to get and uh, it'll have to be modified in some way, perhaps even scrapped in a different line of attack, adopted. Professor E.T.S. Walton, who went on to win the Nobel Prize for Physics some 20 years later. Living conditions in Connemara in the 1930s were so bad that the government of the day was forced to try a novel experiment, resettling whole families in the rich lands of County Mead. E <laughs> On the morning of Friday, April the 12th, 1935, the buses and lorries arrived in Connemara to bring the colonists to Rakharn. The Connacht Tribune reported the event thus. As I turned a bend in the boring and came within sight of the hovels, there were little more. I heard a wailing cry which pierced my heart. It was the old women keening, and their wailing, rising from a crooning diminuendo to a piercing crescendo, sent a shiver down my spine. As I came closer to the cottages, the villagers clustered at the doors of their homes, as if loath to leave. They had heard the lorries approaching, and they knew the time of parting was nigh. One man, a big strong fellow with a wife and large family, talked to me while his few meagre possessions were being loaded onto the lorries. In the old days, it was to America, away across the seas, that we sent our people. Now, the bright steamship posters that we used to see outside the stores aren't there anymore. There are pictures of the volunteers at the post office and at the barracks. And now we are to go away to Meath, the pasture country, to make it Irish-speaking, the government says. With tear-dimmed eyes, he looked around at the land of his birth. It was poor enough land... I'm glad we ought to be that we're getting brand new places, he continued. But it's hard to leave it. My people were here longer than I can remember, and I love the place. There were three estates, fake, and the Land Commission acquired them because the three estates were adjoining. Maher belonged to a man named Maher. Another belonged to 
Heffelman and another belonged to Fesler. Paddy Gleeson. The land was divided into holdings of 22 acres. Each holding had a new dwelling house, outhouses and a turf plot in a nearby bog. Each holding was also given a maximum of three cows, two heifers, 12 sheep, one sow, two bonnets, 21 fowl, horse and cart, donkey and cart, harness, plough, two harrows, scuffler, roller, ploughing tackle, wheelbarrow, turf barrow, dairy utensils and shares in a mowing machine and a potato sprayer. Settling into County Mead was difficult for the colonists, but they brought many skills with them, including that of putching making. I'm far sure we said you're not putting, I guess. I can imagine you want to say that you're going to pack it, then you're going to put it in a putting, you're going to put it in a ass book, I guess we miss you on our boy, I guess we miss you on your own, I guess. I guess we should have taught for you to know that, I guess we can tell you more than three well, it's more school, I guess. Han är kvarsa och stärkas. Du tjänar sig med sin råg, går och säger dina pottin. Och sin råg säger med sin råg, bör och känner dig och säger kan. Blir hon och särg i hur och säger gå. Och så råd sig trassna och dig. Ta här morgon och så må skäll och stå och säger. Ta färren och säger att säger dina pottin, kan du hålla sig med gå. Ja, tog punkt och bodde jag låg och ta här morgon. A cautionary tale from Martin McDonagh. To end this program, a memory from a great pianist, Charles Lynch. Here he recalls the first public concert he attended as a student in London. At Queen's Hall, Sir Henry Wood, whose name was legendary to me, <laughs> I had early records caught off him. <coughs> yes, indeed, I remember that night so well. Moisevich, who afterwards became a great friend of mine, in fact gave me some lessons in much later years. He was playing that night and I also had early records of him. So that was a great thrill, but also it so happened that um, Ravel, who already had become one of my favorite composers, his piano piece, Jeu d'eau, which I still play frequently, I had got to know that the year before through a Moisevich record. Well, that night, the first performance in England of his orchestral work, La Valse, The Waltz, was performed. And the thrill of that is something I can still feel. The programme was presented and produced by John Quinn.